Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are here today to announce the uh, open letter that was sent by JVMI, Justice for the Victims of the 1988 Massacre of Political Prisoners in Iran, JVMI. The, we have today three speakers, uh, myself, Tahar Boumedra. I speak on behalf of JVMI and also Mr. Struan Stevenson. And we are expecting uh, Baroness uh, Verna to arrive uh, any time now. So I would like to just start with an introduction to the, your attention about these activities and how we reach we reach this stage where we want the Human Rights Council of the United Nations and uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights to be fully involved in the uh, trying to establish an independent commission of inquiry into the massacre. Uh, all of you know that this situation of the massacre of over 30,000 political prisoners, uh, it started by the issuance of a fatwa of the former uh, Supreme Leader uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. He issued a fatwa to eradicate all the opposition and he was targeting particularly the members of the Mujahideen's organization. So the over 30,000 people were massacred and they were victim of this fatwa. And up till today, the perpetrators have not been held accountable for their crime. This crime, no doubt, is a crime against humanity and also a crime of genocide. It's been described as such by the United Nations independent experts and by very notorious lawyers who are specialized and who had already acted in other commissions of inquiry on genocide and hate, crimes against humanity. Let me remind you, in the activities of JVMI, we started with a process of investigating the massacre based on the work undertaken by the United Nations and the literature produced by the United Nations in the follow-up of this crime. And uh, in, on the 3rd of September 2020, seven United Nations experts wrote a letter to the government of Iran drawing their attention to this crime against humanity, a crime that might amount to genocide, and giving a warning to the government of Iran, telling them that they need a clear answer before a certain date. Otherwise, they will call 
on an international investigation of the crime. And uh, this sort of ultimatum passed, and the government of Iran did not respond. So this is a challenge not only to the United Nations human rights mechanisms, but also a challenge to international law. And this is a regime that is placing itself above international law. And this is why we need to bring this regime to accountability. We need that everybody who participated in this crime, including the current president of the Islamic Republic, Ibrahim Raisi, they need to be held accountable. Now, we have come a long way in this process. And uh, the United Nations independent experts have written to the High Commissioner and also they issued a number of reports. These reports have confirmed that the crime indeed took place. They have confirmed that this crime qualifies as a crime against humanity and possibly a crime of genocide. And they are calling on the international community to act towards bringing the perpetrators to account. Now, we cannot accept that the United Nations pronounced itself on such very grave issue and then leave it to the oblivion, uh, not bring its acts in conformity with declarations. We want the United Nations to be also held accountable. And who is holding the United Nations accountable on this issue is the UN experts themselves. They want to see their reports being taken seriously and acted upon. Now, we have written an open letter. The JVMI has written a letter, open letter to the Human Rights Council and forwarded to the High Commissioner for Human Rights. This letter, which I think has been, a copy has been distributed uh, to the journalists. This letter was signed by over 400 uh, highly qualified experts and a uh, large number of uh, dignitaries and authorities. I might say, cite just few of them, um, starting by the former president of the International Criminal Court. Uh, excuse me, just to uh, welcome Baroness Verna, uh, she will be speaking after me because I understand that she had urgent commitments right after this uh, talk. So she will be invited to contribute with us before she leaves. Uh, just to say that uh, the open letter to the the Human Rights Council has been signed by uh, over 460 dignitaries and experts on human rights and genocidal issues. Among them, the former president of the International Criminal Court and the current special advisor on criminal on crimes against humanity, 
to the prosecutor of the International Crim Criminal Court. Also, the current special advisor on war crimes to the prosecutor of the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, also, among the signatories of this letter, uh, there is the former, a former president of the Security Council. There is also signature of a former president of the Commission of the Human Rights Council itself. Uh, there are. There is also a former High Commissioner for Human Rights. Maybe you will hear me say informer. A former, of course, is an authority, authority in his field, and they know exactly what they are signing for. They are experts. So I could see even on the list 18, 18 laureates of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. So you have the uh, letter and you have the list of the signatories on the letter that has been distributed. And uh, we want, as JVMI, together with a large number of NGOs, civil society uh, members, requesting that the United Nations act according to their says, according to their principles, according to their values. We cannot expect them to declare principles, values, and then just forget about them. This has been done for the last 30 years. And the families of the victims cannot long wait any longer. A crime that has been testified by survivors, prisoners who survived the event, a crime that has been uh, reported by a member of the United Nations uh, human rights mandate holders, a crime that has been reported by the special rapporteur on the human rights situations in Iran. All these reports confirmed by NGOs such as Amnesty International, which has called for the prosecution of the perpetrators, among them the current president of the Islamic Republic, Ibrahim Raisi. So this is why this initiative of launching a open letter is just to say enough is enough, time to prosecute those perpetrators, to bring them to justice and to hold them accountable for the crimes they committed. So uh, you are invited to uh, look at the letter and you will see all the uh, reports and all the evidence available. And also there is a book published uh, by myself on behalf of the uh, JVMI. This book is uh, available. Uh, I think I saw it uh, at the entrance, but uh, whoever will be interested in the research done in this book about the crimes committed against the uh, political prisoners in 1988, a soft copy uh, is available to whoever is interested in looking at them. I say that and uh, I would like to now pass the uh, Micro to uh, Baroness. Uh, it's your it's 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 your line, and uh, after that, uh, Sue and Stevenson will take the speech. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, it is always difficult to follow such eloquent uh, mastery of words, but I think you summed it up so well on why we are all here today and why we need to keep pressing hard with all parliamentarians and all governments to ask the Iranian regime for, to be accountable over the 1988 massacres. We need to support um, governments that are standing up and speaking up, but all governments really do need to support the UN investigation into the, those atrocities that were carried out in 1988. Um, as somebody who came into politics really to be the voice of the people, particularly for women and girls, this has really, really phased me why we still, all of these years later, are asking for the same rights to be upheld or the people that have lost loved ones in a massacre that nobody has yet been held accountable for. When my on, right honorable friend, Dr. Matthew Hofford, the MP in September, asked the assessment from the Foreign Office of the merits made up of a UN-led inquiry into the 1988 massacre, the then Foreign Office Minister responded by urging Iran to allow the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Iran access to the country so that he could conduct research and investigate into human rights concerns that were reported there. And that included the 1988 event. No government should tolerate the impunity enjoyed by this current president, President Ibrahim Raisi, on his part in the massacre. All governments should publicly use the fora it has at the UN to push for an inquiry that would hold him and others accountable. The Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights finds no legal barriers to an international inquiry into the massacre, not least following the support of the world's uh, most preeminent human rights experts, which letter has been um, unveiled here today. We believe that the UN now needs to act. It needs to make amends for the decades of inaction that have only fueled the culture of impunity that now exists in Iran. As early as August 1988, when the Iranian opposition leader Masoud Rashavi sent a telegram to the UN Secretary General at that time about the mass mur murders of that summer, the UN knew what was happening. So it's time to put an end to the UN's inaction. Surely it is global human rights, the community that has been working so tirelessly to mobilize an international investigation into that massacre, that pressing need for accountability in Iran, and the gaining of the parliamentarians from across the globe, that this really now needs to come to a point where we do get this proper, proper inquiry investigation. The parliamentarians have called for UN action to challenge that impunity that is prevalent in Iran. I am really, really honored to be part of a team of parliamentarians that from the UK in both houses have signed this open letter that is being unveiled today. However, I would like to draw attention to the, the action being undertaken by my colleagues in the House of Commons in support of the UN inquiry of 1988 massacre. Recently, an early day motion was tabled in Parliament called recognizing the 1988 massacre in Iran. I will repeat it over and over again because those dates, those events should not be left to be a choice words when it comes to it. We should always remember 1988 and then the associated word massacre. So far, it can be seen on the parliamentary website. It has been signed by many MPs from across the political spectrum. The EDM 615 states that Parliament supports justice for the victims of the 1988 massacre in Iran. It recognises that thousands of political prisoners, as many as 30,000,
6,000 people were massacred based on the fatwa by the Iran's supreme leader Khamenei, primarily targeting members of the opposition who have continually remained bedded to their beliefs. That motion expresses deep concern of the impunity enjoyed by the perpetrators of the massacre who are today running the Iranian government and the judiciary. And it recalls that Amnesty International has identified President Ibrahim Rahizi as a member of the 1988 Death Commission, which carried out the enforced disappearance and extrajudicial executions of thousands of political dissidents. Importantly, the MPs who have signed that motion say that Parliament shares the belief of human rights experts that in 1988 enforced disappearances and the extrajudicial executions in Iran amount to an ongoing crime against humanity and genocide. And it calls on the government to seek a UN commission of inquiry into the massacre. Along with colleagues across the globe to commit to this important conference to the cause of the families that for decades have sought accountability. They want and need closure over the atrocities perpetrated against their loved ones. We need to stand up for the rights of those people whose rights have been curtailed. It is so important that in this world of 21st century that we don't allow atrocities to continue and fail the people that over the years have looked to us to get their rights reinstated. So I will stop at that. There are many, many decisions that need to be taken, but I do believe very strongly the past histories of tyranny tell us a lot that closing our eyes to what is in front of us, staying silent is just not what we should be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Baroness Verna. Uh, obviously, the families of the victims are very proud to see people like you on their side calling for uh, to stand against impunity and to bring the perpetrators of the massacre to account. We are all indeed very proud to have people like you and your colleagues to support this case. Thank you. Now I will uh, ask uh, my friend Sean Stevenson, who is very well known for his support of the case, the cause of the uh, uh, former prisoners massacred in 1988. So he will speak for himself. I will not. Uh, speak on his behalf. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Thank you very much, Tyre, and thank you, Baroness Verma, for your uh, very eloquent remarks. I just want to emphasize that this letter and this list of 463 international experts, including 18 Nobel laureates, including the former head of the International Criminal Court, this is an explosive issue. The UN Human Rights Council cannot ignore this. They cannot ignore this. This letter today is absolutely fundamental to uh, bring an end to the suffering of the survivors of the horrible massacre of over 30,000 political prisoners in 1988, almost all of whom were supporters of the Mujahideen -e Khalq, the People's Mujahideen of Iran. They were subjected to three minute hearings in front of Abraham Raisi and other murderers. They were asked, do you still support the PMOI-MEK? And if they answered yes, they were lined up and then taken in batches of 10 or a dozen at a time into a large chamber where they were hanged. Some of the survivors who 
actually managed to survive because they fainted when they saw their colleagues being hanged. They have survived to give witness to this atrocity, this genocide. Now, today's letter should bring the perpetrators to account. Let me tell you that last October, when I heard that Ibrahim Raisi was intending to come to Glasgow to attend the COP26 Environmental Summit meeting at the invitation of the United Nations, we organized a press conference that my good friend Tahar Bamedra and Hossein Abedini, that some of you may know, attended. We had handed over a dossier of over 100 pages of evidence from survivors of the massacre or their families, families of people who had been executed in 1988. We handed that dossier to the Metropolitan Police here in London and to the Chief Constable of Police in Scotland, calling for the arrest of Raisi if he set foot in the UK. Mysteriously, about two days after the uh, headline appeared in one of the biggest tabloid newspapers in Scotland, front page headline, Arrest the Butcher. Mysteriously, a couple of days later, a senior civil servant of the regime in Tehran appeared on national government television saying that Raisi had no intention of coming to COP26. And he'd never intended coming and indeed hadn't been invited to come, which was a lie, because it was a UN conference. He, in any case, did send a delegation to attend the conference. So we were successful in stopping him coming. And if he thought that he could claim diplomatic immunity as a head of state, then it's interesting to note that last year, the International Criminal Court launched proceedings against Rodrigo Duterte, the president of the Philippines, for his involvement in the extrajudicial murder and killings of people that he accused of being involved in the drug trade. So serving presidents are not immune. And he had better be warned, uh, Abraham Raisi, if he sets foot perhaps anywhere in the West, particularly after today's explosive letter signed by these 463 experts, he could face uh, imminent arrest and his impunity will end. Let me also say that uh, in his report to the UN General Assembly last summer, Professor Javed Rahman who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran and a prominent uh, QC here in uh, the UK. He raised concerns regarding the destruction of evidence of the extrajudicial executions that took place back in 1988, because the regime are now trying to cover up the mass graves, trying to concrete over them, trying to destroy any evidence that could lead to uh, their uh, arraignment in front of the international courts. And indeed, any of the survivors or families of people who were executed who try to raise the matter, they are quickly arrested and could face uh, severe punishment and torture themselves. So, Professor Rahman, uh, he is in a key position to uh, forward any full international investigation. He's calling for this to take place. And now, as you have seen in some of the posters in today's conference, Agnes Calamard, who's the Secretary General of Amnesty International, has also called for Ibrahim Raisi to be investigated for crimes against humanity and for his involvement in murder enforced disappearance and torture. We know that Raisi was directly involved when he was uh, head of the judiciary in ordering the shooting to kill 
of over 1,500 mostly young protesters in the nationwide uprising that took place in Iran in uh, November 2019. 1,500 people were shot dead on Raisi's instructions. Thousands more were wounded. The wounded were often dragged from their hospital beds, taken to prison, tortured, and subsequently some of them executed. That is another indictable offence, another crime against humanity that can be laid at the door of Raisi. One of his henchmen at the time of the 1988 massacre, Hamid Nouri, stupidly uh, thought that he was uh, absolutely immune from jurisdiction or arrest and traveled to Sweden where he was arrested in Stockholm airport and is now on trial in Sweden for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And many of the witnesses against him bore witness to the fact that he was the one who lined people up, shouting their names out to take them into the execution chamber. He is uh, now facing European justice. We know also that uh, Asadollah Asadi, who was uh, a, a diplomat of the Iranian regime, is now serving a 20-year sentence in Belgium, caught red-handed by the European uh, police trying to uh, bomb his involvement and in trying to bomb an international rally of the Iranian opposition that many of us attended in 2018, June in Paris. So the Iranian regime is now on trial and facing justice in several different courts. And today, this explosive letter calls for the United Nations to stop dilly-dallying, stop hesitating, bring Abraham Raisi and the other perpetrators of genocide and crimes against humanity to face justice. The time is up for all of these criminals. Thank you. Thank you, Sroen. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the uh, families of the victims obviously uh, are thankful to your support, to the continued support you are lending to this cause. And uh, I think with your support and the support of people like Baroness uh, Verma, uh, the case of the uh, execution of the political prisoners in Iran will be heard by the United Nations and I think the United Nations should act and act now. Uh, let's say that uh, the letter to the Human Rights Council and to the High Commissioner is now distributed and uh, please go through it uh, we intended to distribute it for uh, transparency and for to bring it to the attention of the international community that the families of the victims are intending to act and expecting the United Nations to hear them and to uh, serve them justice. Please whoever have any questions to direct to the panel, you are very welcome. Yes, sir. Hi to everybody. I am one of the plaintiffs of the Hamid Nouri's court trial in the Sweden and I'm one of the survived people in 1988 massacre. I know that there are many people who tried their best to do something against these criminals, but uh, unfortunately, it seems to be that there isn't a, a strong will 
to do something serious. Although I have heard that many times that enough is the enough, but indeed nothing serious happened. And I like to know that how much I know that you are doing your best and everybody and we are doing our best. But the question is that how uh, many percent is the chance to, after your open letter, we can do something to take the perpetrator to the justice and doing something that we never say that enough is enough. Thank you. Basically, uh, this letter points out the failure of the United Nations human rights mechanism. So far, they have failed and failed the families of the victims. And this letter is meant to tell them, let's move on this issue. We have the evidence. The perpetrators are identified and the laws, international law is clear about the acts committed against the political prisoners. So we expect from the High Commissioner to take action and call for an international commission of inquiry. This is within her jurisdiction. Uh, herself, Madame Bachelet, and the former High Commissioners before her, they already acted on other issues similar to this massacre of the political prisoners. They did establish commission, commissions of inquiry. And in the same process, we would like them to acknowledge the uh, failure of the United Nations in following on this issue, and we would like them to act. Let's be clear that the uh, Human Rights Council is a political body. The members of the Human Rights Council do take into consideration political issues in taking decisions. But the High Commissioner, he is an, he is a, uh, an officer of the United Nations whose mandate is clear, is to promote and protect human rights. Therefore, within this mandate, we would like the High Commissioner to take action and establish a Commission of Inquiry. Could I add to that that the United Nations and many member states in the EU and many members of the United Nations are showing hesitancy and nervousness because ludicrously they think that the uh, nuclear talks in Vienna can somehow or other be revitalized. They are looking almost for uh, a miracle of raising the dead in the, the nuclear talks. Let me remind everyone that the deal that Obama struck on the, the nuclear talks, the JCPOA, back in 2015 was a 10-year deal, a 10-year program, after which the Iranian regime was allowed to continue uh, with its production of nuclear weapons to its heart's content. We've now seen seven years of that deal expired. There is no point in trying to revive a three-year deal. And we know from endless evidence that the uh, Iranian regime has gone on before, during, and after the signing of that deal in attempting to build nuclear weapons. They're still doing it. So no kind of deal is going to stop them building a nuclear weapon. And the West should stop kidding itself that there is some possibility of reviving the JCPOA. So stop the hesitancy, stop the faffing around and start taking action against this criminal regime. It's the only way that they will understand 
uh, Western uh, values and Western power. If I may just very quickly add to that, it really isn't just about the Western powers. This is really a conversation that needs to span all of those countries that are in the UN. Because the responsibility of human rights should never ever rest with one part of the world. And I think whilst we can lead the charge, we need to have the engagement of absolutely every country. If we allow, if we allow human rights to diminish to the point where we are failing to talk about it freely, we fail every single human being simply because we have given the go-ahead that these discussions are too difficult. That these discussions, because they may jeopardize something that actually you're right, may never ever come to fruition. So I think for me, all of us have a responsibility and every single person sitting in this room has a responsibility that there needs to be political will. Political will comes from the people people pressing their representatives, wherever they are in the world, to actually be united on fighting tyranny. Because we know from past events, if you don't collectively fight it together, you see even further deaths. So I hope, following on from, you're, you're absolutely right, but following on from that, let every country take responsibility and let's bring more people into the tent because it's not just about this regime and human rights. This should be a torch on every regime who has poor human rights. I've got a question on Bardi Afshin from Ira International TV, and this is a question from Baroness Verma. You just said that uh, it's not about Western governments, it's the responsibility of all nation, state nations, all countries but how UK government can support your cause. And knowing that, you know, uh, the attempts for releasing dual nationals present in Iran wasn't a success for them, how they could support your cause. So that's the key, isn't it? The key is how do we get everybody that is politically representative in within the, both houses? Um, to, to actually take charge of making sure the message of human rights is not lost. Now, I, I accept that, you know, there are dual national, nationals in Iran that are the victims, actually, of this political um, play out that's going on. But we, my job, I believe, is that I came into politics, as I've said, to ensure that difficult things are raised, if difficult issues are raised, we need to be able to get political figures across the globe to be able to understand and raise them. And I think we do ourselves in a political uh, systems no justice if we aren't prepared to do that. Um, you know, people say to me, why am I interested in this particular issue? My interest is that women and girls their rights have diminished over the years and get less and less. It is important for me to make sure that I stand up and fight hard to, the, to those voices that haven't got a voice. So there is, there is a real big conscious decision on my part. And I know many parliamentarians have the same sort of um, conscious decisions on why they, they support issues. So I think for us, the message is to make sure we get it out there. Like, like we said earlier, you know, letters like this are important to your point. We can't put, take the foot off the pedal. We just have to keep going. Ultimately, you know, we get enough support for people to, to come together to get this dealt with. Uh, let me add uh, a few words about the attitude of the governments. Uh, in July, last July, uh, we filed here in London with the Metropolitan Police, we filed a complaint against Raisi being identified one of the perpetrators 
of the uh, political of the massacre of the political prisoners. When we filed the complaint, when we went to the Metropolitan Police, we went there with the belief that this country is a democratic country. It's a country that values human rights. It's a country that respects the due process of law. And it's a country that has a credible, honorable justice system. The case filed in July 2021 is still pending. And we believe that the British judicial system is capable of uh, implementing international law. International law gives them the right to exercise the universal jurisdiction over crimes against humanity and crimes of genocide. We believe that this country will exercise eventually this kind of jurisdiction and bring the perpetrators to justice, to the British justice, whenever they step on, whenever they come to this country. We know that political issues are always delaying justice. We also believe that a delayed justice is a denial of justice. But still, we are hoping, and the families of the victims will not stop their hope that Britain will uphold the rule of law, the due process of law, and justice will prevail in this country. I think I've asked this question before. Is it to do with trade, why the British government and all sorts of people don't do anything? Is it to do with trade? There is virtually no trade uh, because of the tough sanctions regime that was oh, introduced right. by former President Trump. Uh, his maximum pressure campaign virtually closed down trade with the Iranian regime. China, of course, and Russia, uh, I'm sure this is why Abraham Raisi wanted to come to Glasgow to attend COP26 so he could rub shoulders with other perpetrators of human rights abuse like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. But uh, we stopped him in his tracks, but they continue, of course, to trade uh, where they can circumnavigate the uh, sanctions. But you know, for anyone listening to the regime demanding that all sanctions are lifted as a prerequisite to uh, them resuming the nuclear talks in Vienna, a regime that is actively backing Bashar al-Assad in his 11th year of his civil war that has led to the death of thousands, tens of thousands. They're actively backing the Houthi rebels in Yemen. They're actively backing the, the brutal mobilization, uh, people's mobilization force in Iraq, the uh, brutal Shia militias in Iraq. They're backing the terrorist Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza. This is, these organizations are all being funded by the Iranian regime, ending sanctions because of this stupid, uh, you know, defunct uh, nuclear talks would simply kickstart their economy and allow them to send even more funding to all of these proxy wars that they're uh, financing across the Middle East. So Baroness Varma was absolutely right. You know, it's time that all countries in the world, including neighbors of Iran in the Middle East, joined forces and said, we cannot allow this, uh, you know, constant uh, export of terror uh, 
proxy wars to continue to disrupt peace and, and to continue to uh, bring conflict to uh, countries around the zone. The time has come for Raisi and his colleagues to be held to account. His crimes will not be forgotten or forgiven. And we won't rest until we see him brought before the International Criminal Court and charged with genocide and crimes against humanity. Any more questions? Uh, from, from journalists? Any journalists? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry again. Uh, I would like to come back to 1987. It was 10 months prior to the mass killing. Actually, there was a, actually lots of torture regarding to collective exercises. There was a gas chamber that probably you have heard that, about that, but I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about the last time that they tried to uh, break the, us and uh, don't let us to continue our collective exercise. <clears throat> After torturing us, a high-ranked person came there while we, had, uh, we were blindfolded and he asked us, uh, I put up a little bit our uh, actually blind uh, fold, and we did. And uh, we never uh, saw that guy at all at the prison, and seems to be that should be a high rank, because everybody of the prison guards and so was very, very humble, uh, actually, uh, by, by him. Uh, he told something at that time that I never forget. He told us, never ever uh, deceive by the UN and the Western countries regarding the human rights. And they never ever exchange your uh, red uh, blood, the entire of your uh, red blood, even with one barrel of the black uh, oil, you know. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, I t without that, uh, oh, he's joking, because we very, uh, actually were very, very optimist about, about the uh, UN and the Western countries and so. But 10 months later, actually it happened. <clears throat> you know, the mass killing of the 1988. And at that time, without that, how was uh, he serious? It wasn't a joke, it was the real, you know. After that, two vice Mr. Galindopol, at that time, the human rights uh, commissioner came to Evin prison, you know. Nothing happened, you know. And it told us that how that guy was serious again. Now 33 years passes. At that time, at that time there wasn't any such uh, uh, proxies or so. You know, if Iran was very weaker that at, at this point. You know, now 33 uh, years passed, you know. And we understood that up to, to, the, to, to today that <clears throat> even the mass killing of 30,000 political prisoners, you know, is not a red line for the Western countries. And I believe that even the Mullah's regime knew that, and even <clears throat> they knew that even massacre of 1,500 uh, people in the street in Aban shouldn't be the Western countries and human rights red line. And is the reason that even the uh, uh, condition of the prison is not is the same as before. It was two weeks ago that one of the prisoner uh, uh, back to, uh, up you know, uh, actually killed. I better say that killed in prison, but nothing happened. Just condemn and condemn and condemn and con condemn. You know, as one of the survivor that I never forget that what happened at, at us at that time, <clears throat> I cannot honestly uh, 
uh, be positive because I believe that uh, the actually uh, <clears throat> politics is more than the human rights and uh, unless something changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, came to the end of the allocated time, but just very briefly to tell you about the UN system, uh, you have to take into consideration two elements. First, the human rights system in the United Nations goes through this progressive development. There is, it's not like a course of law where the uh, verdict is made and sharp, it takes a decision. That's not, the UN system does not act like this. It acts through a progressive development of the situation. And if you look at the case of the political prisoners in Iran, we have progressively came a long way. The other thing is that the United Nations system reflects the uh, views of its member states. So the UN itself is the global views of the member states. Therefore, politics is always involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.